Mark? Yes. Okay. All right. And both of you want to speak, and we'll call on you at the appropriate time. We'll let them know you're here. Okay. Okay. Are they ready? Okay. All right, we are ready for our next case. Mr. Spano, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number. Good morning, Ms. Renasa. My name is John Spano. My DOC number is 367260, ma'am. Yes, and for the record, I did not state that we are now convening at Louisiana State Penitentiary. And so before we get started on your case, I'd like to have the staff there at Angola. Please introduce yourself for the record. Deputy Warden Rochelle Angola. Jane Babel, offender record. And everybody? Okay. And uh, I'd like to ask your attorney uh, to introduce himself for the record, please. Good morning. Tanner Woods, um, here on behalf of John Spano. Um, thank you for y'all's consideration, and we're excited to meet the case. Okay. And we'll usually do that at the end. Is that okay with you after the meeting? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and also here with us in Baton Rouge, Mr. Spano, is family members Mark Peters and Jill Peters. And both of those folks want to speak on your behalf and will ask you to do so at the appropriate time. First, I'm going to just read some identifying information and then we'll start the interview process. Uh, Mr. Spano, you're, as stated, your DOC number is 367260. You're here today seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in October 2006 in the 1st Judicial District, Caddo Parish, as a habitual offender for second-degree battery, currently serving a life sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Your case this afternoon has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer her questions? Good afternoon, Ms. Spano. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Ms. Mott Jackson. I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm fine. Thank you. How old are you? I am 45, ma'am. When do you make 46? Next month, right? Um, yes, ma'am, in August. 11. Yes, ma'am. I'm putting you down for 46, okay? Yes, ma'am. And how much time have you actually served in this case? Uh, in this case, ma'am, I got uh, incarcerated in 2002, so 20, well, almost 20 years. Okay, so this incident didn't actually happen until 2004. Yes, ma'am. You were incarcerated on the rape charge. Is that correct? That is correct, Ms. Jackson. Which was ultimately dismissed as a result of your being found guilty of second degree battery and being. Uh, adjudicated as a habitual offender and receiving a life sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So you've been in since 2004 actually serving time for this job? Yes, ma'am. Um, so Tell us what happened, Mr. Spano, in, in the case that you're incarcerated for right now. Tell us what happened. Ma'am, uh, the attorney that I had assigned to the case uh, filed ready and did all the paperwork. They removed that attorney uh, right before trial, which was uh, the weekend. Uh, they assigned me a new attorney, Mr. Ricky Swift. Mr. Swift came and seen me. He explained to me that he just got the case, that he was going to file a motion asking for a continuance because he did not file ready and there was no way that he could properly represent me. He did go in the courtroom and file the motion. They denied the motion. Also, he stood up, made an oral argument to be removed as counsel because he couldn't properly represent me. At the time, they denied that motion. When they denied that motion, I let my anger get the best of me, and I punched Mr. Mr. Swift, 
one time strike him in the face, which I do regret. Well, why, why are you angry with Mr. Smith? I felt as though that they was trying to mess over me, ma'am. And Mr. They have. Mr. Swift did everything he could to help me. And at the time, I thought that the DA's office and Mr. Swift was working together, which after looking over the thing, the situation, I realized that Mr. Swift did everything in his power to help me. And I'm sorry for hitting him. Are you hitting watching he fell? Yes, ma'am. Did he hit his head on something? I believe he suffered a cut in uh in above his eye, ma'am, due to the punch. I don't know if it was from him falling. I believe it was from him getting punched, ma'am. Okay. So, you know, obviously I've got to ask you about the rape case. Yes, ma'am. Um, what were the accusations against you in the rape case? Ma'am, uh, in that case there, I was dating a young girl. Her fiance was in the military. Uh, in the, the night in question that she said she was raped, uh, it happened in my parents' home. My mother, my father, my sister, and her daughter was at the house. Uh, as you can look at my record, I'm not a good guy. And her husband, her fiance at the time was coming back from the military. And she went and told the sheriff's office that she actually told the, her friend that I had raped her in my parents' home. And I went, did the investigation. I talked to the investigator. Uh, I took drug tests because she said I was on drugs and everything. I passed all that. Uh, I was under full cooperation. And it was her word against mine. There was no evidence. The sheriff office arrested me for the charge. I pled not guilty. I stayed not guilty for almost two years, ma'am, going back and forth to court. And I'm still not guilty of that charge, ma'am. I did not sexually assault that lady at no time. All right. Well, you're actually, you know, they ultimately dismissed the rape charge, and it may have been because you received a life sentence in this case, but I'm not going to speculate on, you know, the, under, the, the merit of the underlying charge, because I don't have that information for me. I do see that in 1996, you had an aggravated battery where you received a four-year sentence. What was that about? Miss Jackson, that was a fight uh, in high school. I was my senior year. Actually, 1995 should have been the date of arrest. Uh, How old were you in 1995? I was, I was a juvenile. I was 17 years old, ma'am. And what happened in the fight that caused you to get an aggravated battery charge? Uh, me and a couple of my friends was out. Uh, we stopped at a gas station. We had got into a fight with a group of guys. There was a chain and a tire tool. Some of the guys got hit with uh, different weapons. Uh, I threw a chain with a lock and hit a guy with it. And that caused me to get aggravated battery. I received four, I pled guilty of four years hard labor, ma'am. So you were not probated, you actually served four years in prison? Yes, ma'am, I never had probation. Did you, you did not get a suspended sentence? No, ma'am. Also, in connection with that, there was a cruelty to a juvenile. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in the process of the fight, there was a lady and a child at a red light. Someone hit the child. Uh, I took full responsibility for it. The lady said she could not identify no one. Hey, uh, well, someone, you know, either you hit the child or, or you hit, you, you did it or you didn't. So I, 
I, I, I did do it because it was my actions that caused the fight, ma'am. So what happened to the child? Uh, in the process of fighting, uh, the child got struck at the red light. Uh, like I said, it was a bunch of us fighting and the child got hit. That struck at a red light. Was the child in a car? Yes, ma'am. And the vehicle that the child was in got struck? No, ma'am. Uh, I reached in the car and hit the child. There was another person in the car and the child got hit in the process. Now it makes sense. So one of the people that you were fighting with, I have been fighting with, was in the vehicle. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. And then in 2000, you had a simple battery. Yes, so, ma'am. What was that about? You got and, 30 days in Paris jail for that. And what, what was the date, ma'am? It was 2000. You played guilty to a simple battery and you got 30 days. Yes, ma'am. That right. was that was a fight in uh in the city jail. Uh, I pled guilty to thirty days. I was in the city jail doing time for a uh, traffic ticket and another violation, and had a fight while I was in the city jail with another offender. Okay. Uh, you were also had ninety eight. You had a simple burglary where you got 15 months in DOC. What was that about? Uh, me and my girlfriend uh, jumped the fence at a man's house out in the country and trespassed on his land and went into his cabin and was swimming. Uh, nothing was vandalized. We, uh, The sheriff's department got called and Come and arrested me for a uh, simple burglary. Burglary of what? <laughs> it was a it was a hunting camp, uh, a fishing camp. Okay. And then I saw another simple battery that had started off as a second degree battery. It got reduced to simple battery. And that was in 1998. Remember that? Yes, ma'am. That that Miss Jackson, that one there was a also a fight in a city jail. I was locked up doing time for something else and had a fight in a city jail and with another offender. Well, why so many uh, fights? Why so many crimes of violence? Ma'am, uh for as long as I can remember, I had a problem with losing my temper. Uh, most of the time dealing with arguments and arguments lead to uh, me getting into fights. I learned uh, that was a main trigger in my uh, arguments was, was cause my temper to have outbursts and everything. And I would get real upset. So with self, Help programs and I learned how to control it, help people instead of having disagreements, listen to people. Let me ask you this Did you figure out why you were so prone to get angry? Ma'am, I had the my bitterness and everything usually came from arguments and disagreements. And like I said, self-help programs showed me that it, it doesn't have to be angry towards disagreeing. Why are you walking around with so much anger? That's what I'm trying to figure out. What were you angry about? Who were you angry? I mean, why so much anger? I didn't I didn't have anger, ma'am. It was mostly uh my temper. Temper and anger are the same thing. What do you mean? Well, I would lose my temper at different things and at arguments and disagreements. I learned how to control it. And how do you control it? Tell me how you control it. I control my temper, ma'am, by 
positive thinking. I listen to people now instead of arguing. I offer self help and I learned that you don't have to argue or disagree with somebody. You don't have to result in violence, that you can be a better person. I do see that you've only had one write up that was in 2009. It was for a contraband. What was that about? That was stamped envelopes, ma'am. I had in my possession stamped envelopes. Where'd you get them? I got them out the canteen. Purchased them? Yes, ma'am. They sold them in the canteen? Yes, ma'am. Why was that contraband? Because they said the amount that I had in my locker box. How many did you have? I had, I believe, 400 and something. Okay. Why'd you have so many? Mailing hobby craft out, writing letters. Guys get stamps and don't need them. Give them to me. I wrote a lot of letters, mailed a lot of hobby crap out to my family. I did not realize that they was contraband and they actually gave the stamped envelopes and everything back to me after I pled guilty in court. Uh, you've been a minimum A trustee since 2015, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What's your job at the prison right now? I work maintenance, ma'am. Specifically, what do you do? Air conditioning, refrigeration, and carpentry. Okay. Uh, and I do see that you got a letter of commendation from the maintenance department supervisor. Yes, ma'am. You also have uh, very positive remarks on your institutional record. So I see you've only taken a correct me if I'm wrong, you've taken a hundred hours of free relief, cage to raise, and living in balance one and two. Yes, ma'am, and I am currently taking thinking for a change. How long have you been involved in thinking for a change? For four weeks, ma'am. You took living in balance with the substance abuse program. Um, what, what were your substance abuse issues? My substance abuse issues was drinking, ma'am. How old were you when you started drinking? Uh, say 15, 16, hanging out with older friends. What, what, what kind of drinking did you do? Mainly beer, ma'am. How often were you drinking? Uh, usually on weekends, Ms. Jackson. Did you um, ever progress to other alcohol or to drugs or to more frequently than on weekends? No, ma'am. It never progressed to drugs. I had never had a drug problem. But once I got older, I started going out uh, after work, drinking with friends on weekdays and stuff like that, Ms. Jackson. But Never heavy drinking. How many days a week did you go out drinking? Maybe two, three days a week. Plus weekend? Plus weekend, yes, ma'am. What do you call heavy? That sounds kind of heavy to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm heavy drinking is like what I would say drink all night long i wouldn't do that because i always had a job i would go out for a couple hours drink and then and go home well, what did you learn about your your drinking habits and living in balance ma'am i learned that even social drinking uh can be a problem if it's not controlled i learned that when you uh, social drink, and as I did, if there was an argument or anything like that, it would lead to me getting into a fight or me leaving a, a bar or someone's house mad or losing friends over that. So I learned that I attend classes uh, weekly here in Angola uh, and express that and help other people dealing with that, and they helped me. I did learn that, ma'am. 
So you do see a connection between alcohol and, and anger and temper. Yes, ma'am. So how do you plan to avoid that? It, it per, to prevent that, ma'am, put myself around positive people, uh, continue go to church, continue uh, working, and just avoid drinking, period. I, I don't need it in my life. It's been uh, destroyed most of my life, ma'am. Well, how, how are you going to be able to avoid drinking? Because your friends are going to want to go out. You'll be at social events with your family. It'll be beer and maybe a little liquor. How, how are you going to avoid drinking? It's going to be all around you. Um, well, ma'am, I can avoid it by drinking Coke, drinking Dr. Pepper, drinking water. I do not have to socialize with people and drink. I have learned that. I can socialize with people and drink water. Have you taken anything like AA or NA? We, we do an AA program uh, nightly at Camp F, ma'am. Wow. Go, go ahead. I go up there and fellowship with the guys and fellowship with them outside of the AA. You say the, when you say fellowship with them, what do you mean? I mean, sit down, talk, discuss problems, discuss different situations. Uh, so help. you're actually participating in the AA meeting? Yes, ma'am. Do you think AA or NA is something that is important for you uh, on the outside? I think AA is, ma'am, and I think people with positive outlooks and on life and just in general is. Church, I attend church services, Cowboys for Christ at Camp Elf. There's all kinds of services that have positive things in them. And how important do you think it is to attend AA meetings? As think, part of your plan to maintain sobriety. I think it's real important, ma'am. I mean, so tell me, because when I asked you what was your plan, you kind of didn't mention AA, you mentioned church and other people, didn't hear you mention AA as being part of that sobriety plan. Well, uh, Church, uh, the the twelve step program is it's church based and it's founded on that. So church AA uh, is uh, goes hand in hand. I do think that both of them are, are real positive. I'm a, if if released, I will attend both of them, ma'am, because I need that. So let's talk about transition plan. If you were successful, where would you live? Where would you work? How would you support yourself? Ma'am, uh, I have a skilled trade of heating, air conditioning, refrigeration. Uh, I also have an EPA hazard chemical license that goes with the refrigeration. I have a resident plan at my sister and brother-in-law's house. I also have a job reference plan with a guy that owns a construction company. I would support myself by getting a job with him and I would live with them. Them, them being? My sister, Mark Peters, my sister, Jill Peters, and my brother-in-law, Mark Peters. Warren, what can you tell us about Mr. Spano? Okay, I can tell you that Mr. Spano is a class A trustee. He uh, has worked outside detail. He has uh, did renovations at the governor's mansion. And he's also, when LCIW was moving to Jetson, he was part of the work crew that uh, that renovated the uh, Jetson compound for the women to be transferred there. Um, he helps with renovation of houses and repairs of houses on the B-Line, for the uh, B-Line community. And he also do air condition uh, repair. Uh, and he is uh, an AA. Um, only one DB report, and it was the one that you spoke of. And I heard him say that they gave him his stamps back 
but they only gave him the fifty dollar uh, allowed limit for the stamps. Um, the rest of them they uh, they confiscated. All right, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, I have just a couple questions for you, Mr. Spano. Just listening to you, tell us when's the last time you got angry. The last time I got angry was about three months ago, ma'am. And I got angry because uh, it was at a job and we was doing an install and somebody wanted to do things their way because their way seemed easier for them. And it would have been easier for me to do it my way, but I compromised with them and let them do it their way and eventually got the system hooked up and then came back later on and showed them how the book says do it and explained to them after everything got calmed down. I resolved the situation by doing that thinking instead of acting. Okay, good. So I was gonna ask you the last time you disagreed with someone, but I guess that was it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. What kind of hobby craft do you do? I, I do metal work, ma'am. Okay. Metal jewelry. All right. I don't have any other questions. And I and I want to uh, acknowledge that we have also on Zoom your sister, Miss Diane Sprayberry. We'd like to hear from you now, ma'am. Hello. Yes. What would you like us to know? I would like you to know that he means a lot to all of his family and that we know that over the years that he has changed and he has tried to do better. Um, and that he is very family oriented. And I would like for you to know that if he, if he is granted his pardon or parole, that we will do everything that we can to help our brother stay on the right track. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your remarks today. And we'd like to hear from Thanks. the other sister. Could you step up to the podium? Thank y'all for letting us be here today. Uh, I just want to say that we think that John needs a second chance because he's done so good in Angola. He's been there 23 years. He's been very good. Um, got all the certificates, so I think he's ready to be out in the world and show what he's got. Um, and we'll take care of him, don't you worry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Peters. Thank you for taking us today, and uh, I just want you to know, thank you and the system for changing this man, making him a real man, instead of a young, angry boy. And we have seen it every time we go down there, we get Acknowledge how good he is and how well he participates with everything, and the system does work, whether people believe it or not. He's living proof of it. And I just want to thank y'all for giving us this chance. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We do have to also on Zoom um, is Mr. Ricky Swift. Is he still, yeah, he's still there. I have an indication that he does not want to speak. Uh, but I would give you that opportunity, Mr. Swift, if you'd like to say a few words. You're, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I would just like to say um, briefly, uh, in 30 seconds or less, that uh, I did represent Mr. Spano, and I heard what he said. Uh, I would differ that I was not prepared, but I was trying to assist him in getting his case continued because that was his request. Uh, however, uh, many times they defended, we'll wait to the last minute and tell the court that they plan on hiring a, an attorney. And that was actually the situation that the day of trial, uh, Mr. Spano announced to the court that he was hiring an attorney and the court gave him an opportunity to have that attorney come in and represent him. Of course, that didn't happen. So therefore the court denied the continuance based on 
it was an attempt to delay the trial. And lastly, I would like to let the panel know that uh, Mr. Spano had every opportunity to go to trial and prove that he was not guilty of this rape. The reason he hit me is because he knew the evidence against him was overwhelming, that he would be convicted, that once he's convicted, I informed him that he would be multi-bill and receive a life sentence. And that's why he panicked because he really didn't want to, want to go to trial. So he was looking for a way out and his way out was to hit me in order to avoid being convicted of the rape. So that's all I want to say. Yes, sir. And we did receive your victim impact statement that you submitted earlier. We have that in the record. All right. Um, before we turn it over to Mr. Woods, Mr. Spano, is there a statement you'd like to make? Ma'am, the statement that I'd like to make is uh, I am on the backlog list for victim awareness. Uh, if I would have completed that course, like I did, I did apologize to Mr. Swift. I want Mr. Swift to know that I am truly sorry for hitting him and disappointing my family, ma'am. The people that care about me the most, I let them down. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Woods. Thank you all. Let me start by talking a little bit about who Mr. Spano is. And I haven't known him for all that long, and we just recently got hired. But I feel like I know him from the conversations that I've had with him already. I, I also grew up in the Shreveport area, and so I, I, I feel like I know this area. I know kids that went to Southwood High School like Mr. Spano. And I will say that most of the, the, the kids that I know from Southwood High School got into a fight or two in high school. That was, it, it is a very country sort of rural school and, and fights happen, things like that happen. And I have no doubt that Mr. Spano, and I'm sure that he would agree with me, that he was a rowdy, rambunctious, you know, high school kid. He got into some fights, he made some stupid mistakes. And his his brother-in-law was actually then now with, his, with Jill for, a little over 38 years. I've been with him since John. They've been together since John was 12. He was one of the main, you know, role models for John. He was telling John all along, you know, that you got to stop this. You got to stop getting in all these sites. You got to be getting in trouble. At one point, I think he even kind of predicted the future and said, you know, if we're getting in trouble, something bad's going to happen. You're going to wind up in jail for a trouble. Mr. Spano, unfortunately, didn't learn that lesson early enough. Um, and he found himself on trial. And I, I just want to go back to that morning or, or the evening before, the first time that he's ever met Mr. Ricky Slim, his defense attorney, he's going to trial for an aggravated rape charge the next morning. Mr. Spano knows, and he's got six witnesses. He was talk, talking about him here today. He's got six witnesses, two of which were out of state. Um, and that had been filed in motions indicating that they needed time to get the, the two witnesses from out of state here. And then he had the four witnesses that were in town. He had a defense that he wanted to present. Mr. Ricky Swift had not been on the case long enough to understand that defense. And he panicked. He panicked. The motion for continuance was denied. The motion for withdrawal was denied. And he panicked. And he made the, the worst decision of his life. I, I would ask y'all to not hold the rape charge. And, and, and it really is surprising to me that his own defense attorney is holding a rape charge that he was not found guilty of and that was ultimately dismissed. And he is arguing here today that that rape charge is the reason that he should spend the rest of the time. And I, I, I don't think that's true. There is a reason that the, the rape charge was dismissed, but they could have continued to prosecute it. I know that if any of my family members were making a charge like that, I would still want to prosecute it. I don't care that he's already been sentenced. I would still be pressing that he should be free to prosecute it. I think that the fact that it was dismissed shows that they were looking for the easiest and quickest way to have him sent away for the rest of the life. He has done more. There is not anything else that he could have done since he's been incarcerated. He's had one write up in 2009 over the 22 years that he's been in Angola, which is impressive in and of itself. He has worked a plethora of jobs. He's worked in the governor's mansion. He's been allowed to work at the rifle range around guns. He has been giving the most trust that any inmate in the facility could be given to class A trustee. He was even authorized to go off of Angola's campus to do 
different age strata come out, so I understand. Um, so I, I believe that all of this weighs heavily in the favor that he has learned a lot over the past four years. He is not the same person that he is. He has learned how to cope with his anger. He's learned how to deal with this grievance. And I, I believe that he deserves more chance. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. All right. Well, we're done. Yes. Mrs. Jackson. All right, Mrs. Spano, um, you know, I wrote on my notes, we'll decide after the interview. Decide after the interview. I wanted to hear you, wanted to see you, wanted to see how you react to things. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that a person who has had so many issues with anger in the past and has spent uh, your incarceration in Angola and you only have one white house. And that wasn't even for fighting or anything related to anger. And to me, that was impressive. You've only had one write up. Your institutional record is good. And you had very positive comments uh, from your evaluators. You had very important, uh, very positive comment from the maintenance uh, department. Uh, and so, my vote would be to uh, grant your request and recommend communication since 99 years. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Mirabella. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Spano, uh, I've listened intently to uh, what you had to say, and uh, I've been in the criminal justice system for 50 years, so I, I understand how trials work. I understand how Defendants and public defenders often have conflicts, and uh, lawyers want uh, defendants want them to do more than than perhaps what the lawyer can do. So I can understand how that was a, a disagreement. Uh, they did drop the rape charge. Uh, uh, don't know why, as Judge Jackson said. Don't know why they dropped it. Maybe uh, because uh, they were going to get you with, with, uh, with this charge, uh, but they tried you for this charge as opposed to the rape charge. The rape charge was that strong, it seems to me, they would try to that. But that's just my opinion. Uh, you made an uh, uh, excellent presentation today. Uh, I think you've had a good prison record. Uh, my book, likewise, would be to recommend the governor that he can reach your sentence to 99 years. Mr. Freeman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Merlo. Colleagues, and I also vote to reach your sentence to 99 years. All right, Mr. Spano, for all the reasons that have already been stated, my vote is the same. So on your behalf, sir, we're going to make that recommendation to the governor that your sentence be commuted to 99 years. Thank y'all. Y'all will not be disappointed. Thank y'all. Thank you. Wow. Okay. I, we're going to unpack this. We are going to unpack this. I I have some things to share about this hearing, but I got, it's like, where do we start? So, you know, in contrast to another hearing that we just saw where the person was just so crisp and rehearsed and here we're, I really kind of just felt we were we were getting what we saw, except for the stamp thing. You know, stamp is, is currency. Uh, so pre-stamped envelopes is currency. And to have that many, he was doing some, he was, you know, it wasn't just like his own personal use. So he shouldn't have lied about that. But the idea that the attorney that he hit shows up. 20 years later or something is remarkable to me. And I, I, I just can't believe it that uh, a public defender, someone who spends their life um, as a defense attorney would show up 20 years later to keep some, another, to keep his former client in prison for life. And he he accused him of being guilty, which 
it just seems totally like proof and point there. And now I'm nervous about this attorney. And let me just state this for the record. Everything is my own opinion. It always is. It's just an opinion. This is, I am only speculating. What does Dr. Grande say? I'm only speculating on a situation like this. Okay. Don't come after me, please. Okay, so let, let's, there's a few things I want to share here. Let's go to, um, this is the, the, so can you imagine he gets sent to life? It's like out of the movies. And, and I, I wish that there is, uh, you know, this happened in 2004. The iPhone wasn't invented yet. Yahoo was still being used a lot. So, you know, you just didn't have things, news online like it would be today. It would be a sensation, right? So I, I can't, I, I just, this is, you know, pretty much all I could find. But but um, let's see where it is. Gosh, why, why is, why is it like so hard to see this? Let's see if this helps. Okay. So, on July 12, 2004, Spano was in court for his pre-trial, uh, pre-jury trial, and another matter, along with his court-appointed uh, indigent defender, Ricky Swift. And I read this before seeing it, but I didn't put two and two together that, the, that the, his defense attorney showed up. Prior to announcing ready to begin a jury trial at the defendant's request, Swift urged several motions for continuance. After the trial refused to continue, um, after the trial court refused to continue Spanish trial, Swift stated that the defendant was to was ready to proceed and begin to prepare his notes for trial. The defendant stood up and addressed the court that his family had hired another attorney. The court indicated that the defendant could hire another attorney, but that the case would proceed to jury trial. Following a bench conference, Swift returned to his chair and gathered his notes. The defendant again stood up and then struck Swift a severe blow to the head. If you can imagine, <laughs> you know, maybe that's why he's so upset. He just remembers it. He's sitting there. I mean, who does that, right? <laughs> and and the court was just like they just threw they gave him a life sentence this man was given a life sentence the assistant district attorney brad o'callan and Dew thompson saw the defendant hit swift according to witnesses spano reached his hand back and struck swift using the full force of his body Spano used profanity and said something like, you're trying to get me a life sentence, or you're not going to get me a life sentence. The blow knocked Swift forward and out of his chair and onto the floor. O'Callan rendered first aid. I feel like I hear... Um, so, uh, Thompson, blah, 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 blah. I hear something. It's you know when I wear these headsets, the problem is is that I picks up every sound. It's like I, it's like I have superpowers, and then I don't know if you hear it too. And it's quite distracting, and it could really be like like a sound that's that's across a room somewhere. Hold on one second. I gotta... It's just my headset. It's like I couldn't hear it without the song, but I'm sorry about that. So 
Right. So he so that's what happens. He he punches his attorney in the face, which again, well, I guess we'll get into this later. And there's some stuff on this attorney that um that I that I found on the internet that that you know I think it is what it is. Um we'll we'll go over that soon. So the blow knocks were forward, then he ran out of his chair onto the floor. Callan rendered first aid by applying pressure from his hand onto Swift's head wound in an attempt to stop the flow of blood. So, yeah, it was a hard hit, man. He observed huge blood stains on the floor that Swift and that Swift's both eyes closed and was unresponsive. After a couple of minutes, the courtroom was cleared and secured. Thompson and Deputy LaFall collaborated this account of the crime, both noting that Swift's eyes were closed and unresponsive to physical touching and shaking. Swift recalls the defendant saying there's five things that Swift recalls. The defendant saying something about him not representing correctly, being on the floor as he bled profusely from his left eye, being treated at a hospital where he received several uh, sutures to close his head wound. I know I pronounced that wrong. Um, that his eye was painful, bruised, swollen for a couple of weeks, and that he received follow-up medical treatment. As a result of the accident, the defendant was charged in the Bill of Information with one count of second-degree battery, for which crime another petty jury convicted him. Thereafter, the state filed a fourth felony habitual offender bill. So the, the state was like, oh, you're going to do that in my courtroom? You're going to wait for life. You're going to wait for life without parole. Because that's what it is. This wasn't a parole. This was a commutation hearing. He was recommended to the governor to get parole. You're going to go away for life. Which, you know, it, it, man, I mean, he does have a long track record, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel very like American, you know, it's like, it, it just feels like something that would happen in, and I don't know, China or like, some third world country, you punch an your point, court appointed attorney who thought you were guilty uh, in the face. Um, you're going to wait for life. We're throwing away the key. You're going to die in prison. Um, and, and he's not a good guy. He's not a likable guy. He's, you know, he's, he is what he is, what you saw, um, which actually makes it um, incredible to me that he only had one write up in Angola. Hard to understand that, but, um, what stuck out for me the most was one the 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 man who's who he's in prison for life for shows up at his court hearing twenty years after the fact. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't speak back. He actually like he was calm, cool, and collected, um, which showed me a lot. It was interesting. Um, anyways, so. Uh, the, in the trial in part fact that the defendant wore his prison armband through the trial. It was argued that the uh, producery jury against the motion in the trial denied. Why was he wearing his armband? Um, and then they go through the list for the habitual offenders. So he has the 90. You know, and he has a lot of, he was a fighter. He was, you know, he was just, he was not. Um, I'm sure it was really, you know, easy to want to lock him up forever. I get that. But still, it's, uh, there's a lot of other people they should be locking up forever, in my opinion. Now, um, here's what what is interesting. This is what I found when I Googled Ricky Swift. And he was reprimanded. So the state of Louisiana... Um, he got his license in 1986. The Office of Discipl Disciplinary Counsel found him guilty of the following misconduct. They said that he filed a frivolous sham lawsuit, engaged in conduct prejudicial uh, to the administration of justice, threatened to bring disciplinary charges against an attorney solely to obtain advantage in a civil manner, violated or attempted to violate rules of conduct, knowingly assisted or induced another to do so or did so through certain acts. As a consequence of his misconduct, the enablers for attorney misfits sitting on the Louisiana Supreme Court punished Ricky by, I don't know why they call it gifting him, a complimentary reprimand. That sounds such a 
weird choice of words. We gifted him a complimentary reprimand. What? <laughs> uh, this one looks a little bit more English to me. It's uh, it's the same thing, but they basically it says that the Office of uh, Investigation, so they allege all this stuff, and it is ordered um, to be accepted. He was he was publicly reprimanded. Um, they're responsibly placed on unsupervised probation for a period of one year. Also, the costs and expenses were assessed in, against him. Um, legal interest, 30 days from the date of finality court until judgment is paid. So he, he here was a man who, you know, was reprimanded. And I don't know what that means. You know, he, he's he's been licensed. He's been licensed for uh, a very long time, since 1986. Maybe there are a lot of defense attorneys will have, you know, one thing on their record. I, I don't understand enough of it um, to say if that's enough evidence, so to speak, to try to, to me, what it seemed like, again, just uh, speculating on a situation like this, that he's kind of, that person might be a little bit like vindictive. I don't know. But again, he showed up all these years later to try to keep a man who hit him in the face locked up for life. And he's a defense attorney. He's his job is to defend those who don't have money on very severe cases. And in this situ in this scenario, he did something which the which which John's attorney I thought handled brilliantly on the counter side by basically saying like even on this case the attorney states that he was guilty of a crime that he wasn't committed guilty of and a crime that he was supposed to be defending him and I'll tell you this I couldn't be a jury on his trial because I was falsely accused of doing something by a woman so I. Although I'm a major victim's advocate, I have my personal experiences where I just don't believe everything you hear. You have to, I just can't because of my experiences. Um, I can't, I, I can't speculate whether, you know, but the idea that, that his attorney said he was guilty beyond a doubt and he was going away and he was mad at me. I don't understand how that's true. This was, this was, they didn't, you know, the, this is like, um, even today, it's still one of the hardest things to convict people of. And this was another thing on that note, when everyone was talking about, well, if he was guilty, they, they, they would have tried him. And I said, no, what do you mean? We see it all the time where they don't try it, especially in 2004. So I disagree with everyone else was saying, it's hard to try these cases. It's hard to, especially back then, it's, 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 it could be a coin flip how the jury reacts. They don't want to put the victim on the stand. They don't want to um, do all of that traumatization. And, and, and so I, I don't know why everyone was acting on the board like, oh, it's, uh, if he was guilty of it, they probably would have tried him because I, I disagree with that too see it then not, they seem to try to avoid and if they can get an easy way out and just lock them up for life of course that's what they would do and that's what they did they had a close shut case with him hitting his attorney and then they did the habitual offender bill we see it happen all the time so i don't know what they were going on about but man i It was uh, it it was a wild. It was really, I thought, a wild ride. Um, you know, there there's there's the only thing you might say is, hey, how can you? He never took a life. He doesn't have the conviction of that assault thing. You know, he was saying, look, I was sleeping. You know, it wasn't like it was a random. You know, whatever. We don't need to go there. We just don't know. But. Um, the main concern is, is he, is his temper just totally out of control? Like, is he going to get on the street and, and hurt someone and, and violate parole and get back in prison? And he got one right up in Angola. I mean, I 
you I would think that if you're gonna fight, you're gonna fight in Angola. So versus the streets. And and uh he looks like a hard dude. He looks like he can, you know, it's but ultimately I think the board got it right. I really do. I, I just I can't believe that uh that that a public defender would show up 20 years later to keep his former client locked up for getting punched in the face and calling him guilty of a crime that he was supposed to defend him on. It's just that whole scenario blows my mind. And uh, I don't know. I'm going to look forward to reading all these comments because it's, it's therapeutic um, and insightful. Uh, but with that, I'm going to let you go.